welcome to Calvary Chapel Somerville. Let's all stand for worship. Let us worship our King. tells us to feed on his faithfulness. He is faithful. He is good.
Thank you, Lord. There is no better place to be than at the foot of the cross. Father, we thank you this morning for your great love for us. We thank you, God, for Jesus, the perfect spotless lamb who shed his blood for each one of us here. I thank you, Lord, that you are long-suffering with us. I thank you, Father, that you are kind, you're gentle, you're merciful, you're loving. Father God, we ask that you would touch our hearts this morning. God, that you would rid us of ourselves, God. Father, that all things would become clear to us as we gaze upon you, upon your love, and what you did for us on that cross, God. Thank you for knowing us so intimately and loving us so intimately. Your kindness leads me to
forever Your kindness is forever Your goodness is forever Your mercy is forever Forever Your kindness is forever Your goodness is forever truly love us. Sing it out, church. He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open 
in the scroll the lion of judah who conquered the grave he is david's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe every nation and tongue he has made us a kingdom of priests to god to reign with the sun is he worthy is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory is he worthy is he worthy is he worthy of this what do you say church Sing in honor and glory. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy of this. He is. Somebody say amen. Thank you for reminding us this morning of who you are, what you've done, what you're doing, and what is to come. Lord, this morning we just place our faith in you, that God, you know us, that you can move in our hearts, that you can change us, you can mold us, shape us more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that you would give your most prized possession, your only son, God, that you could have each one of us, Lord, to draw to yourself. May we draw near to you this morning. You are worthy, and you're good, and you love us. Father, as we respond to you, may our hearts heed your word and open up our understanding as only you can by the power of your Holy Spirit and help us to hear your voice this morning. We trust you and we love you and we praise you. You are worthy of all our praise. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for listening to Change the World with Pastor Vic Carroll from Calvary Somerville. It is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with today's message, here's Pastor Vic. Let's pray. We do give you praise and honor this morning, God. And we come before you in the name of the Lord, asking for your blessing, asking for your anointing. We rejoice in your goodness, God, and therefore we will praise you. We will exalt you. We thank you, Lord, for the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. May your word go forth with power and with might through your spirit. May it penetrate hearts and lives, even to the very marrow of our bones, God. We ask for just a mighty moving of your Holy Spirit in this place. Speak to us through your word, God. Anoint us, bless us, We offer this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, and we are in chapter 11 uh, as we continue our journey through God's Word. And we'll pick up where we left off last week at verse 13. Now, we're in the middle of a section of Scripture where Paul is laying out some foundational principles 
as it relates to the governing of the home and the governing of the church and the authority and, and the chain of command that God has ordained. And as we talked about last week, we know that God is not a respecter of persons, meaning that he shows no partiality based upon gender or race or nationality or social stature. We are all equal before God and all of us who are saved, we are one in, in Jesus Christ. But just as much as God is a God of equality, he's also a God of order. And you can't have order without there being a chain of command. Imagine the Air Force. We have a lot of people in this church that are um, either are or were in the armed services. Imagine any of the armed services that where you have no chain of command, where everyone is of equal rank and, and equal uh, authority. It would be mayhem and, and chaos. And so it is with the, the Christian home and also with the church. And so God has set forth a chain of command that when followed, it's what brings peace and harmony uh, and godly function in the home as well as in your church. And the order, God's chain of command, we saw last week in verse 3, Paul said, the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So it's God the Father, God the Son, then man, uh, and then woman. Um, Christ is God, and you know, he is equal with God, just as men or you know, women are equal with men. But Jesus declared that his role in the Trinity, his role in the Godhead, is to do the will of his Father. And so, too, God has ordained that the woman is to be subject to the man simply because if there's going to be order in any situation, there can only be one head. One person in charge. If you have two heads or two people with equal authority, uh, it might work for a while, but eventually it's going to lead to chaos uh, and confusion. And, of course, the Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion. Paul then began to address the fact that some of the Christians in Corinth, uh, particularly the women, they were exercising their liberties, their Christian liberties to such a degree, that not only was it causing people to stumble, but they were sending a message into the world that did not properly communicate the heart of God. And it did not properly communicate conduct befitting a child of God. And Paul throughout this section of Scripture has pointed out how our liberties are important, but that our love for God and our love for others is the more imp important ethic. Love is the greater. Love is the greatest ethic. Now, we talked about last week this, this head covering thing or this veil that, that women wore in public in the ancient world. And it was very much something that was uh, culturally driven, but it's very much uh, r relevant to this whole chain of command thing. Because what the head covering represented in the ancient world is it was just a sign of submission. So a woman with her head covered in, in public, what she was communicating in that culture was, uh, you know, what she's saying is that I, I come under the authority of another. Kind of what a, a wedding ring communicates in our culture. It, it means I'm taken. But the head covering, as we talked about last week, it was part of the Greek culture, it was part of the Roman culture, and even part of the Jewish culture. And so any woman in that day, you wouldn't be caught in public without having her head covered unless she was a prostitute. But, but, but that's what was happening in, in Corinth, and it's the reason that Paul is addressing it here, because some of the women who were getting saved there in Corinth and learning of the liberties that we as Christians have in, in Jesus, some of them began to take off their head coverings in public meetings in what they believed was a demonstration of their Christian liberty. But Paul says, eh, you know, that's not really culturally, that's not what you are uh, communicating. It's not the message that you're sending out into the world, this Christian freedom thing. Uh, and, and as I said last week, whether women's heads are covered or not, God doesn't care. This, this wasn't, you know, some act of spiritual defilement. Or, you know, it was, it was very much a cultural thing. But even if it is just some cultural thing, as a Christian... 
you have to still be aware of what you are identifying yourself with. Uh, and you, 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 you still have to have concern about what, you know, the particular message that you're, you're sending, whatever you're doing. It's what, you have to be concerned with what you're communicating within the culture that you live in. Because you can, even though you might have the liberty to do it, you could very well be tainting your, your testimony and, and your witness. I was at a drive through the other day, and I was getting, getting coffee, and the person working at the window was a man, but he had on a full face of makeup. I mean, he was wearing more makeup than you see any woman wear, lipstick and all. And, you know, at first you're like, oh, bless his heart. You know, but I don't know anything about him. I don't know, you know, anything about his spiritual well-being. I can't see his heart. Only God can but I can tell you this, what he is communicating in our culture today, even if he did identify himself with, with Jesus, which I doubt, but if he did, he's not going to be a very effective witness. And so whether these women in Corinth, whether they had the right heart or the right motivation, we don't know. But what we do know is, is culturally, they were not identifying themselves with Christ. They were identifying themselves with the world by taking off their head coverings. They were identifying themselves with prostitutes. That's, prostitutes, would, they would be seen in public without their you know, head covered because they were advertising, for lack of a better phrase. And so this message, what these women were uh, communicating in that culture was, I come under the authority of no man. Not even, you know, I don't come under any husband. I don't come under any pastor. I don't even come under the authority of Jesus. I am my own woman. And so Paul asked, verse 13, judge among yourselves. You, you, you guys ought to be able to figure this out on your own, you leaders in the church in Corinth. Based on the fact that everything we do and say as Christians is to be for the purpose of bringing glory and honor to God. Based on the fact that love is to be the supreme ethic in the heart of a Christian. Based on the fact that nothing I say or do within my Christian liberty should ever cause another believer to stumble. And for the sake of maintaining a good testimony in the world and, and never hindering my effectiveness in being able to share the gospel, Paul says, judge for yourselves. And then he asks, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? And he doesn't, he doesn't ask if it's sin. God doesn't care. But is it proper? Is it edifying? Is it helpful? As it relates to me having a good name and, and therefore being an effective witness for Jesus. Or is it something that could be potentially harmful to my good name and my witness. So Paul says, verse 14, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? And the point there, again, it's, it's very culturally driven. But generally speaking, no matter what culture or no matter what era of mankind, women have generally worn their hair longer than men. And the context here, again, is who there in Corinth, who are you identifying yourself with? Because in that culture, for a man to have long hair, uh, it was considered feminine and therefore not honorable. It was that guy wearing makeup I was telling you about. It's, it's in that culture, it's shameful. But we should note that there have been other cultures in other eras where men having long hair was viewed as honorable. Even among the Jews in the Old Testament, under the law, if a man wanted to take a, a, a vow where he was consecrating himself unto the Lord, they called it the Nazarite vow, uh, one of the conditions of that vow was he, that he was never to cut his hair. They said, let the locks grow. So to take this verse and to form a whole doctrine around it, as I've seen in the past that says men with long hair are in sin and out of the, the will of the Lord. It's clearly a person or a teacher that doesn't understand the, the three most important characteristics in being able to rightly divide the Word of God. And those three important characteristics are context, context, and context. As long as a man is not wearing his hair long, 
as a means of appearing more feminine or seeking to take on the appearance of a woman, God doesn't care. And furthermore, who is it that gets to define what long is? Is it, is it is, if your hair is over the ear, that's long? Well, if you're in the military, it is. Or what about shoulder length? You know, is that long or is that okay? It's subjective. And not just based on a particular culture, but it's subjective based on every person within that culture because everybody has an opinion. And so who gets to decide? It's, it's mayhem. Isn't it funny how every man-made commandment always turns into a legalistic, chaotic mess? Which is always a confirmation. When you see a mess, it's always a confirmation that the Lord's not in that. That's not something of the Lord. I remember when I was 19 years old. And I hadn't been saved that long. I was in a Christian band and we would go from church to church and we would, um, you know, doing uh, evangelism and stuff. Uh, and we would, when we would go into a church, we would usually play, you know, Christian music for about an hour. And at the end, we'd give uh, an altar call. But one time I, I was in this little country church and after we played about three songs, the pastor decided that he didn't want us to play anymore. All of a sudden, he wanted to preach. And so he sat us down and he opened up his Bible right here to 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen, and he began to teach on how sinful it is for a man to have long hair. Well, guess who had long hair? Well, you know. And this pastor, man, he was big and he was mean and he was angry and he frightened me to no end. And by the time he was finished with that message, I was convinced that if I died before I could get to a barber, I was going smack dab to hell. I mean, I just, there's no way around it. What time are they open? I mean, I got to get to Great Clips or something. And it sent me on this downward spiral and it gave me this false impression of God being this angry, vengeful God who the only way we can please him and avoid his wrath is to keep all of these impossible rules and regulations that he has set forth. And that if I didn't, I'm going to get struck by lightning or something. And it's one thing to fear God or to, you know, respect God, but I was afraid, I was terrified of God. Is that what he wants? As a father, do you want your kids to be like literally terrified where they just shake in their boots every time you walk into a room? Of course not. Neither does God. But I was terrified because I thought, God doesn't love me. God's going to kill me. That's what he's going to do. Because I can't, I can't keep from messing up. I couldn't please him according to these man-made legal standards. And that pastor with his long hair you know, for men is, is, is sin message. Me as a young man, uh, new in the Lord, seeking to find his way in the Lord, didn't know anything about the Word. You know, he didn't help to fortify my relationship with Jesus Christ and develop a love affair with God's Word in me. He pushed me in the direction of, of legalism and religion and helped develop a legalistic approach to God that took me probably 15 years to recover from. And I think that, that, that pastors who don't take the time to understand and teach the Bible in its proper context, I think they do more harm than good. That's why if you're new here, you know, teaching verse by verse through the Bible, uh, as we do here, you get God's Word in its proper context. There's not one comma that's going to be out of place contextually when you teach it verse by verse. When you jump around and you tailor messages based on a scripture or two here and there. Uh, I know it's necessary sometimes, and there's some pastors who are really good at that, but it's easy to lose the essence and the context of what is being spoken in the Word. Now, I said I was 19 years old. You fast forward some 15 years, and I remember going to my first Calvary Chapel men's conference. And up there on stage, I don't even remember his name, but what I do remember is this powerful, anointed teacher just Holy Spirit oozing from every pore of his body, the love of Jesus on his face, this renowned pastor, 
and he's up there, he's got a ponytail. That's Calvary Chapel. And I remember thinking, how refreshing, how my life has come full circle with the Word and how freeing. David Guzik says, pastors ought to be more concerned about the length of their sermons than the length of their hair. But I know I don't have any problems with that. <laughs> Either. <laughs> Paul's thinking about letting his hair grow out, by the way. But the point is that Paul, you know, that, that the Apostle Paul, not Pastor Paul, the point that the, the Apostle Paul is making is if that Calvary Chapel pastor at that men's retreat, if, if he was teaching in Corinth, if he was teaching a Calvary Chapel men's retreat in, in Corinth in the first century, then Paul would say, you know what, culturally, it's, it's probably better for you to cut your hair. You're going to reach more people and you're not going to offend anybody culturally. Not that God cares, but... That's, that's the point here. Verse 15, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. That is, she's accepting and honoring her femininity. Another thing that's getting more scarce these days. For her hair is given to her for a covering. According to Paul, long hair on a woman uh, is, is kind of nature's veil, so to speak. It's nature's covering. Um, so a woman you know, wearing a head covering, Paul's saying, even, even, even nature... Uh, it, it says yes and amen to that. But, verse 16, it's an important but because Paul wants to make sure that what he's just suggested, he wants to make sure that we don't go forming any doctrines around that. He doesn't want anyone getting the idea that God is setting this uh, head covering thing as a commandment or that God is, is you know, somehow setting parameters for how long a man can wear his hair, that kind of stuff. He says here, but if anyone seems to be contentious, if this turns into a big fight in your church and it's going to you know, split up the church or whatever, Paul says here, we have no such custom. Now, he doesn't even use the word law. He doesn't say we have no such law, we have no such commandment, but we have no such custom. And then he goes on, nor do the churches of God. So you got one group of people in the mindset, you know, they're dug in, they're saying, you know, women must have their head, hair, heads covered and men can't have long hair. And, you know, and then you got another group just as passionately, passionately saying, no, it, it's the, the head covering, it's not necessary. God doesn't care. We have Christian liberty and, and, and freedom. And so Paul says, if this turns into a big fight, for the sake of harmony, for the sake of unity in the church, the group that is to give in, Paul says here, is the legalists. Those who are putting these extra burdens uh, upon the people. And Paul is he's suggesting head coverings because of you know fortifying your, your witness and your testimony, not harming it. But he's saying don't go forming any spiritual ideologies. Uh, around that because God doesn't care. God's not commanding it. The churches of God not commanding it. Not only is there no such commandment, there's not even such a custom in the church. So you get the idea that the church in Corinth was the only one struggling with this particular issue. Uh, in, in fact, the issue of head coverings is not even brought up anywhere else in Paul's writings or anywhere else in, in Scripture. This was specifically uh, an issue for that church in Corinth. And again, speaking of taking Scripture out of context and forming doctrines around isolated verses, even though Paul says we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God, there are Christian churches today in the world where women having their heads covered is required. And Paul says, verse 17, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. In other words, you guys are coming to church, but you're not coming for the right reasons. You're not coming with the right motivation and the right attitudes. For first of all, when you come together as a church, the biggest problem, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. Paul talked about that back in the first chapter when we began this letter, talked about their divisiveness and the dangers uh, of divisiveness in a church. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. So if there's going to be a faction, get involved in this one. Now we think of, of factions in a church 
mostly in a negative sense, but a group of people who, who, who stands solely on the Word and lives you know, according to the Word. They don't get involved in all of the worldly stuff. They don't get involved in, in, in the sin that's going on there in Corinth in that church. They are also a faction, though. They're a remnant, those who are approved, Paul says. And God loves factions of that sort because you have to have good ones to you know, cast light on the bad ones. And, and one of the things that Paul's going to harshly rebuke here, he says, verse 20, Therefore, when you come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? Communion. For in eating... Each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. Now, in the early church, we know from church history that they would take communion on a weekly basis. We do it monthly here. But we also know that they would combine their communion service with what they would call a potluck. Or they called it love feasts or agape feasts, kind of like when we do koinonia on Wednesday nights, only it was that they combined communion and koinonia together uh, each week. The problem with that was within the church in Corinth, as we talked about in the beginning of this uh, chapter, in the beginning of this letter, you you had people in that church from, from both ends of the social ladder and everything in between. You had very, very wealthy people, uh, as well as you had some slaves in this church as well, and people who couldn't uh, rub two nickels together. And, and obviously, the poor people, when you're going to have a potluck, um, the poor people, they're not going to be able to bring much food, if any, at all. And so the rich people were making sure that the poor people assumed their rightful place in line at the, at the, the food table, making sure they took their rightful place in line, which was in the back. A lot of them, by the time they got to the front of the line to get their food, there would be nothing left. And so, you got one group of people, namely the affluent people. They're sitting over there with their bellies about to pop, you know, like on Thanksgiving, you know, when you're just full of turkey and stuffing and all this. You're like, oh man, I can't take one more thing in my mouth right now. You know, you're just stuffed. And your wife is like, you want another piece of, of, of egg custard pie? And you're like, okay. <laughs> one more. But you've got people sitting there and they're stuffed. And, and, and then you've got another group of people who didn't get any food at all. In fact, they're going hungry. Some of them may have not even eaten for days. On top of that, what Paul tells us is during this feast, there were people getting drunk in the church. And what makes it worse is that their selfish behavior and their drunkenness, they're doing this after having just partaken in the Lord's Supper in communion. And the idea is that they have brought disgrace and shame upon the, 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 the act and the sanctity of communion and what it represents. The pagan temples, they would commonly hold these wild, drunken parties in their temples in honor of whatever pagan god it was they were worshiping. And now the church in Corinth, they were doing the same thing. Instead of holding communion and holding koinonia uh, in an atmosphere of dignity and in a way that honors God, the Corinthian church had turned it into the same kind of thing as the pagan celebrations. Now imagine communion along with a, a, a potluck, and you're calling it an agape feast. You know, agape, godly love, sacrificial love. And that kind of thing every week's turning into a big drunk fest. Imagine calling something an agape feast where well-to-do people are not concerned with the fact that there are people around them that are hungry, haven't had any food. Imagine having a big meal. Your plate is just... and and you're sitting across the table, literally right in front of someone uh, who hasn't eaten for days, and you're scarfing it down, and it never occurs to you to share. 
That's what koinonia is supposed to be about. That's what fellowship is about, sharing with others, others others-centered. That's the heart of, of, of Christianity. But instead, they are partaking in communion, the beautiful representation of the Lord's body being broken for our iniquities, His blood being poured out for the remission of our sins. What is a commemoration of the Lord's love for us, they are partaking in His love and then having the gall not to portray His love to others. They are partaking in this what is the most intimate of fellowship with the Lord while their hearts are about as far away from God as they could possibly be. And Paul says, verse 22, I like this, What? What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink? In other words, if you want to eat and drink selfishly, do that stuff at home. Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? And for the third time, Paul says, I do not praise you. And now Paul is going to lay out the function and the purpose of the Lord's Supper and and what it represents. But he's going to remind this Corinthian church that how they are living is the exact opposite of everything that the Lord's Supper represents. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Paul says, verse 23, For I received from the Lord As a pastor, I appreciate this line because I take my study time very seriously and I take what I teach very seriously. In my prayer, each time I begin to study each week for any particular message, my prayer is that the Lord would reveal to me exactly what it is that that He would have me communicate to you through His Word. That He would make me silent and all that is Vic would just be... um, not heard and that everything that's being spoken would be from the mouth of the Lord. And each time I stand up here and teach, I have no desire to share anything of of my doing, but that I would be able to say to you with all sincerity, here is what I receive from the Lord this week. And Paul says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. In other words, this isn't new information for the Corinthians. Paul had already spoken to them about the Lord's Supper. Remember what I taught you, he says, just as the Lord had taught me that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed by one of his own, Judas, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as you take that bread, that represents the body of Christ. Recognize that it has been broken. And here's the key phrase, it's been broken for you. If you're marking in your Bibles, you want to underline those words right there, for you. And what Paul is communicating to this Corinthian church is that you are partaking of the symbol of brokenness while there's no brokenness in your church, there's no brokenness in your hearts, and there's no brokenness in your lives. And without brokenness, you're eating that bread or that cracker, and it doesn't mean anything as it relates to your own heart. And that makes communion just a ritual for you. And what good does it do to partake in what symbolizes brokenness if the symbolism doesn't mark what is reality in your life. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what is sacrificed by me. Remember how it was that I was broken for you. Remember the stripes. Remember the bruising. Remember how I was pierced. Remember the barbaric and brutal beating that I took for you. Remember how my body was broken, verse 25, in the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, who is able to facilitate a new covenant between God and man other than God himself? What man could do that? All right, God, I got a a proposition for you. And what covenant can be established 
between God and man, according to the Old Testament, how can there be peace between a holy God and sinful man unless there's the shedding of blood, and not just blood, but innocent blood, and not just innocent blood, but the very blood of God himself? And what is blood? What does blood represent? To you and I, it represents life, doesn't it? You don't have any blood, you don't have any life. And so Jesus says, you better not forget my life and the fact that I gave my life. I gave my blood for you. Remember. And the command here, the way that we remember his blood is uh, in communion. We receive it. We take it in. When you eat something, you drink something, it becomes part of you. You are, you are, you are receiving it into your innermost being. That's the symbolism. That's what communion represents. And please understand that I'm not... I'm speaking symbolically here. Just as Jesus did as it relates to to communion. I don't want to get any anonymous letters uh, accusing me of of teaching transubstantiation, which is the, the, the Catholic teaching that, you know, when you ingest the bread, it actually turns into the body... The blood actually turns into the real blood of Christ in in your body. That's not what I'm teaching. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm speaking figuratively, not literally. But Jesus said, John 6, 53, He said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. What life is He talking about? He's talking about eternal life. And it's His blood. Just as blood is life for you and I physically, the blood of Jesus is eternal life for you and I. Receiving His blood, we must partake of His body. We must partake of His blood, meaning as a disciple of Jesus, we partake in His life. And partaking in His life means we partake in His pain. We partake in His suffering. We partake in His death. But because we partake in His death, we partake in what? His resurrection and His victory over death. You see, communion is not just remembering what Jesus lost on the cross. It's just as much remembering what we gained because of the cross. How we are now miraculously, gloriously, totally set free from the power and the penalty of sin. Anybody want to say hallelujah to that? Hallelujah. 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim or you preach the Lord's death till He comes. And so again, just as much as the Lord's Supper is a memorial and a time to reflect and remember all that Jesus did in His first coming, it's also a time to celebrate and look forward to Jesus coming again and receiving us unto His own. And that supper that's going to take place in heaven called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so communion is to continue until uh, the Lord comes. That's why we take communion on a regular basis on the first Sunday of each month. And we'll continue to do that until He comes. Hopefully He'll come before the first Sunday in, in September coming up and we'll just be done with that. But when you take communion in what is a worthy manner as it talks about here, Not that any of us are worthy by the definition of the word, but it just means that you understand and adhere to what it means symbolically. And and the way you live your life gives evidence to that fact. When you take communion in a worthy manner, as it says here, you are proclaiming, you are preaching a sermon, not only to God himself, but to the devil and, and all his allies and also to the world who, whether you know it or not, is watching. Therefore, Paul says, and here comes a stern warning, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that is, with a flippant, irreverent sort of heart toward God and toward the body and blood of Christ, or any person who's not saved, and just as a mockery they take communion, or a lot of times somebody might not even be aware, they get invited to church on a communion Sunday, They're not a Christian, but they see everybody else taking communion and they do it because they they don't want to stand out or or, or whatever. But Paul warns against that. He says, if you partake of the Lord's Supper as an unbeliever 
or with irreverence toward what it represents, then you are making a mockery of the cross. And now we're all sinners. And, and I, don't, I don't want you to get the idea that sin disqualifies you from taking communion. If you come in one Sunday and like communion Sunday, you're like, oh man, what I did last Wednesday, I, nah, I'm disqualified, can't take communion today. When you hear me say on a communion Sunday, let's spend some time in, in private prayer and, and worship, preparing our hearts for the, for the Lord's table, it's not for, for the purpose of you finding reasons to exclude yourself from the Lord's table, but simply to prepare your heart to come to the Lord's table with the right kind of heart and mind and, and attitude. And so I'll say, you, you know, spend some time in private reflection and devotion and some time in repentance if necessary, preparing your heart for the Lord's table. But those with stubborn, unbroken, unrepentant hearts partaking in communion, Paul says here, they will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, every single one of us, God's either going to declare you guilty or innocent based on having received or not received that blood, the blood of Christ. And Paul says, You're going to be found guilty unless you receive that blood with a humble heart, with a reverent heart toward God, a heart of gratitude toward what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Everyone else will be found guilty of the blood and guilty of the body of the Lord. And so, verse 29, let a man examine himself. When you come in for communion, examine yourself. Not to determine whether you're worthy or not, Because I can tell you, you're not. I'm not. But examine yourself to determine that you are coming to the Lord's table with a broken, reverent heart. Thankful for what the Lord has done. That kind of heart. And and you'll hear me say, don't come to the Lord's table with dirty hands. Sort of like when we wash our hands before we eat dinner or, or, or whatever. Same kind of idea. When we are about to come to the Lord's table, that's a good time to do a spiritual self-examination. We're really good at at examining others, aren't we? God wants us to become good at examining ourselves. And then we let Him cleanse us of any areas that we might have fallen short. And then we take communion with all boldness and with all faith and with all love. And again, it's that reverence and that heart of, God, why in the world would you want to have anything to do with somebody like me? And I'm thankful that you do. And in return, I'm just going to love you and I'm just going to worship you and I'm going to dedicate my life to you. And so let him, he says, finishing out verse 28, that cleansed, that man with a cleansed heart, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning or understanding the Lord's body, what it represents not giving understanding and proper respect and reverence for what Jesus endured for all mankind. And the person who takes communion with a a, a flippant kind of heart and attitude, the bottom line is, you're making a mockery of it. You're making a mockery of the blood that was shed on Calvary and His body that was beaten and bruised. And, And as we're going to see here, there are serious physical and spiritual consequences for that kind of, of, of thing. Verse 30, For this reason, Paul says, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, meaning dead. Evidently, some of the people in, in the Corinthian church were mysteriously getting sick and, and even dying. And Paul suggests here that it was because they were partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner turning it into a big drunk fest and all this kind of stuff. And, and listen, God comes along and He judges that kind of thing. Apparently He judged there uh, in His sovereignty, brought forth this judgment. I've heard stories, I've heard Pastor Chuck talk about uh, unbelievers taking communion, people taking communion and making sort of a mockery of it and then dying on the spot, heart attack, whatever. I don't know if it's true. I've never seen anything like that. But I tell you right now, I wouldn't test God in that regard. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, if we would give ourselves an honest evaluation, the first part of repenting from sin is recognizing and owning 
my sin, not blaming others, if we would judge ourselves, he says we would not be judged. We wouldn't have to be judged by God. We're, it's better to judge yourself. And then listening to your heart, listening to your conscience as to what it says, hey, this was wrong. I need to fix this. I need to repent and I need, I need to get back on the right path. And God says, well done. But when we are judged, verse 32, that is by the Lord, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So if you don't judge yourself, Christian, the Lord will judge you. Hebrews 12, 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. So application here, it's better to judge and examine yourself and to obey your conscience than it is for God to judge you. And if God does judge you, the point here is it's better to be judged and chastened by God on this side of heaven in this life than to wait for the judgment than to wait for the next life. Verse 33, Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Have good manners. Show love toward one another. Don't go to the front of the line. Go to the back of the line. Let the poor people go first. Make sure everyone gets something to eat before you go stuffing yourself. But if anyone is hungry, verse 34, let him eat at home. In other words, don't come to a church meal gathering expecting to gorge, you know, expecting to just be filled to the, to the brim and, and, you know, there's not enough food to go around. It's better to eat at home in that kind of situation. Don't come hungry. Paul says, lest you come together for judgment. And think about it. Is food really a good reason to kindle God's anger against you. It's food. Can you think of any food that it is so good that you would say, okay, for that, I'd be willing to take a whipping from God. I can't think of anything unless it's maybe nothing but cakes. Those are pretty... We had some of those this weekend. Maybe Dan May's peach cobbler that he made at the Low Country Boil. No, I can't think of anything that I'd be willing to take a whip in from God. Uh, and, and, and so the point is, is we're, we're talking about food. People being st stumbled. People, people going hungry, hungry in the heart of God, not being communicated unto poor people. Just the opposite of God's heart. Over food. Something that once you eat it, you know what's going to happen to it in about three hours or so. You know, so... Here's Paul's point. He's like, let's just let's keep everything in its proper perspective. All right? And then he says, the rest I will set in order when I come. That's the dad right there. Like you just, he's, you're on the phone with your dad. And he's like, um, so I'm going to say right now, I'm going to take care of the rest of it when I get home. You're like, oh, no. And so he hasn't said all that he has to say concerning this, but he's going he's gonna to save the rest for when he comes to Corinth uh, in person. We don't have any record of what Paul would have, would have said to them in person, but I'm sure it was a very interesting message. Uh, would like to have been a fly on the wall in that one, to say the least. Next week in chapter 12, Paul's going to get into the, the, the various spiritual gifts in, in the church. Very interesting uh, and so looking forward to, to diving into that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. Thank you again for your word. We pray, God, for the ability to be able to not just be hearers, but doers, to be able to receive all that you have spoken to us today, that we might be changed from the inside out, molded more and more, God, into the person that you would have us be, the person that brings you glory and honor in this world, and the person that brings um, joy unto your heart. Would you bless our week, God? Give us an opportunity, Lord. Give us several opportunities to be Jesus unto someone this week. Help us to bless others. Help us to be others-centered. Help us to not be uh, I need to get to the front of the line kind of Christians. Help us, Lord, to make sure that everyone else gets fed even if we don't. That's your heart. That's your mind. 
Help us to represent you well in this world, in our homes, in our churches, but especially out in the world. We love you, Father. We praise you. We thank you just for the power in your word and the ability that you've given us, Lord, through your spirit, through the shed blood of your son, to be able to keep it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never accepted the Lord, if you need prayer, I'm available to pray with you after service. We have other pastors here as well. Don't forget about tonight. Excited about tonight, missions night. Uh, and we haven't done this kind of thing in a long time. This is going to be really special. Uh, so you don't want to miss it tonight here uh, at 6 p.m. at the church. This Wednesday at 7, Pastor Paul will pick up his study uh, in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4. And then this Saturday, don't forget men, it's our men's breakfast, our monthly men's breakfast uh, here at the church at 8 a.m. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out there. Um, if, you can, um, if you can bring some food, that'd be great. Just put it on the list. If not, bring yourself and we'll make sure you get to the front of the line anyway, regardless of whether you brought food or not. So um, we always have enough, except for bacon when Teddy's here. Teddy always eats all the bacon. But that's this Saturday, 8 a.m. Come out for that, men. Then next Sunday, uh, we'll pick up our study right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So let's all stand and close. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound. In your ear. Hey, I love you. So does Jesus. Have a blessed week. God bless you. That's how you change the world. Thank you for listening to Change the World with Pastor Vic Carroll from Calvary Somerville. It is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ.